This is Father Gregory Pine, and welcome back to the Thomistic Institute podcast for our most recent installment of Off-Campus Conversations. As has become our custom, we take the opportunity to follow up with the Thomistic Institute speaker to deepen some, in, in, bleh, to deepen some insights uh, on the basis of a lecture or a conference, either on campus or in the setting of a retreat. Um, so that way we can yeah, kind of chase down the proposals or the conclusions that were drawn in that setting and see if we can pursue the discourse even further. So for this episode of Off-Campus Conversations, very, I am very delighted to be joined by Dr. Paige Hochschild. So thanks so much for joining. Thank you for having me. Um, so, so many of our listeners will know you from talks that have appeared on the Thomistic Institute podcast, interventions on campus or in retreats or from your publications, specifically on, on St. Augustine, among others. Uh, but for those who don't know you, would you say a word about who you are, where you're from, uh, what you do? Um, yes, uh, Paige Hochschild. I teach at Mount St. Mary's University in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and at Mount St. Mary's Seminary. And um, I, I studied at um, King's College in Halifax, Dalhousie, Notre Dame, Durham University. And um, I came to came to the full faith of the church after coming here to Emmitsburg, Maryland, this wonderful place of many saints like Blessed Stanley Rother, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. And I teach at the seminary current, at present I teach natural theology and the grace course. And undergraduates in our department, we teach two required core classes. I teach history, Christian thought and sacraments and our senior seminar, which is based around Vatican II. And I'm grateful for all that God has done in my life and do not understand why he's been so good to me. <laughs> nice. This pleases me. Um, okay, so among the places where you studied, you listed Canada and England and the United States. Are you American or Canadian or English? I'm sorry to say I'm Canadian, but I have a green card. It's totally legal. <laughs> Wait, why do yeah. you why do you apologize for being Canadian? I, it, that's that's a Canadian thing. I actually came <laughs> back to Toronto last night. I did my, my first Thomistic Institute talk there, and at the opening of my talk, I thanked them and said how I did not miss Toronto at all. I hate the big city, um, and but I said I was happy to be with Canadians, and uh, and that I I I I'm regularly persecuted here for <laughs> the virtues of a Canadian. So Americans don't right. understand our. Our, our special superiority. <laughs> so I live in a, I live in a very different environment at present. I live in Switzerland, and um, are you at Freiburg? So I'm in Freiburg, yeah. Um, but as you know well, as everyone seems to know well, Americans aren't especially beloved on the European continent for a variety of reasons, which may or may not have to do with geopolitics and voice modulation problems. Uh, but yeah. it's fascinating that often when I am in mixed company, which is to say people of different nationalities, and there is a Canadian present, the Canadians will often clarify the fact that they are not American. That's, so... that's just an inferiority <laughs> complex. Yep. Yep. I, I, I don't know I, if it's I, that. I, I'm so happy you're in Freeburg, though, Father Michael Sherwin invited me there for a conference that was all moral theologians. I was totally out of my depth. But it was wonderful to be there, and I got to see a, a beloved friend, Bishop Marode, for a while, as well as see the the wonderful library at the Albertinum. So I hope to come back soon. Nice, that's awesome. Well, Switzerland awaits. Um, so seize the opportunity and prepare to spend more money than you have ever seen leave your wallet in one go. Um, it is so punishing the things that happen when you unpeg your currency. I don't know anything about economics, so passing on to our next point. Um, you're you're living holy <laughs> poverty, so you shouldn't know anything about economics. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Well, uh, the mountains are free, so I spend my time there when I'm not spending my time shut up in my room fixing footnotes. So God be praised. Um, okay, so you recently gave a lecture at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, my condolences to the aforementioned school for the suffering that it has endured in its basketball fate. Um, but, um, you, you spoke specifically about ecclesiology. So I thought in this conversation, we could kind of, um, explore the mystery of the church in its current setting. Um, and then also think about ecclesial discourse. So like given the nature of the church, how then do we speak about the church? How then do we recognize and receive the church? How then do we shape our lives or pattern our lives after that of the church? Okay. So 
Um, sell me on the church. Not that one needs to be sold on the church. One is baptized into it, becomes a member of Christ's body. Boom, done. Selling done. But um, you look back at earlier expressions of the Christian faith and the tradition, and there doesn't seem to be as much insistence on the church. Now, mind you, it's present everywhere. But like you think about just a couple of examples, St. Thomas Aquinas, he doesn't have a treatise on the church. He kind of covers his bases in the treatise on faith, on Christ, on the sacraments, or you think about the fact that the church never promulgated a, a document de ecclesia until the Second Vatican Council, or you think about the fact that like in the present catechism, the church has dedicated considerable space, whereas previously uh, it was not dedicated as much space in catechisms. Um, so what is it about the church and what is it about the church in the 20th and 21st century that is especially of interest? Okay, well, please cut me off at any time, but... Nah. Um, what, when I ta taught ecclesiology to undergraduates, which is interesting here because you have maybe 40% Catholics, 30% um, committed Protestants, and then the rest, it's all completely new to them. Um, and I was a very committed and I think well-formed Anglican Protestant in, in, in Canada. And, uh, but looking at the scriptures, there are these passages where I had a hermeneutic lens and just stuff I didn't see. Like, what's up with the twelve? You know, the discourse of Peter, or, or the various discourses. You know, you're the rock, so to speak. Um, but the significance of the Ascension and Pentecost. So, so when when I do that course with undergraduates, and I, I hope a subtle way, what I try to emphasize, I, I mean, our Lord was a literate Jewish kid. And he eventually was identified as a rabbi. He could have written a gospel. He could have written a creed. That would have been super convenient. He didn't. He wrote in the ground. That's the only account that we have in dirt in the gospels. And instead, his big idea was to take the 12, who are not super impressive men, and take them on retreat and keep them close to him. And as you know better than I do, every time they, he sends them off, right, and when he gives a passion prediction, especially when their faith wavers, when they stray from him spiritually, um, the power that he shares with them fails. Um, so I, I, my, my point about my, my previous hermeneutic lens is that you can read the Gospels and not see that this was God's plan, Pentecost, basically. Whether that was a great idea or not, you, you tell me, but it's what God did. Um, and, and even at the end there, the, the start of Acts of the Apostles, things are not looking very good. And, uh, and you know, the, the, they're looking up at the sky or at the ascension. The angel comes and says, what are you doing? Or the end, I remember a, a wonderful priest, Dominican, um, at New York University, great homily on, on the end of the Gospel of John. As he, as he reads the end of the Gospel of John, they basically went back to fishing as their job. And our Lord appears and has breakfast with them, and then the road to Emmaus. They they just don't get it. So God works with us as we are, and to me, that is the greatest consolation. He takes us as we are, and then gives us the He gives us everything, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, all the gifts of, of the Holy Spirit. So it's everything in a way is about the church, because um, yeah, at, at Pentecost you read on Acts, and all of a sudden Peter is he's insane. He's almost a little much after that. So, and I think that the it actually Bishop Marode's book about um, the human quest for truth, the Church and the Human Quest for Truth, I think articulates this really nicely. The mode of revelation tells us what the Church really is. So, when you say that we don't really have a document in the Church till the 20th century, yes and no. I mean, as I, I said to you before, I mean, in a way, Saint Thomas in the third part of the Summa, writing on the priesthood and medi the mediation of Christ. Um, how he's related to God on the one hand, how he's related to us, the church on the other hand, and then going to the sacraments. Like his doc, his teaching on the sacraments is his ecclesiology in a way. Um, bracket or, or an additional point there too is one has to historically track the church as a visible institution in relation to the state. But then even when you look, for example, at the encyclicals of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, like on on freedom and this and that he calls the church a society. So so a lot is taken for granted, I think, there. But you're right, there isn't really a treatise on the nature of the church. But I think Romana Guardini, looking back, sees that we get to the 20th century. We have this, on the one hand, a commitment to individual dignity, which is, as John Paul II would say, good, but has its downsides. 
on the other hand, were, were deeply formed by a sense of the independence of nation states and ethnic groups and cultural ethnic identities. And we have to rethink what it means that the church is Catholic. And, th and that's as a, as a last point. To me, that's one of the, the most interesting arcs from Vatican I to Vatican II. A lot of students and seminarians here at the Mount don't really know what to make of Vatican II. We had a lovely lecture by George Weigel here last week on Vatican II. And um, in a way, as he presented it, I would, I would do the same thing in class. Um, what you see happening in the arc from Vatican I to Vatican II is the full fruition realization of what Augustine was talking about in the city of God. The Holy Roman Empire is not the church. We just have to get over that. Um, and the church is Catholic. It is visible. It is earthly. It is what God planned um, to happen on the one hand. On the other hand, it is, it, it's, it's the kingdom of God. It's eschatological. It's heavenly. It's real. The saints are with us. And now you come in and give me a hard time about something, I hope. No, I mean, not necessarily a hard time, but maybe follow certain things up. Um, I think that, okay, so let's talk about the nature of our relationship to the church. Obviously, yes. the commanding or the kind of governing scriptural images are organic. So it's no longer Christ who, excuse me, I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He is the head, we are the members. And as a result of which, the, the manner of our membership or incorporation, depending upon which language you use, uh, is more intimate and more sublime than those of other relationships and especially as you know a variety of institutions break down in the 20th and 21st century not in the sense that the institutions themselves and their essence are failing like marriage but in the sense that their historical realization has fallen on hard times i think we're struggling uh kind of imaginatively or analogically to hold on to some sense that this relationship is thicker or this relationship is realer so what i mean you're trying to explain this to a 19 year old who has only ever had elective relationships in his or her life. It's like, not my president, like not my dad, not my, you know, it's just like you can kind of bracket and or cancel whomever you deem toxic at the moment uh, or re-describe as it fits your fancy, your whim, your caprice. Okay, so how then do we enter into the mystery of the church as something, something more real, more thick? I mean, I would immediately come back and say, who is your daddy? I mean, I mean, this is... Uh, like really like first of all, we don't choose our mother and our father like family including the family that you experience in religious life you're kind of stuck with them and that's in a culture in which identity is a constant source of anxiety and something that is put on the individual to craft i think to receive something even with all the darkness that is attended with that has got to be a grace um because we're not god um, we're finite beings, and we're also social beings, fundamentally. Um, so, I mean, that's sort of the first thing that I would say. And, and then, you know, moving to Revelation, it depends on what kind of nightshine you're, you're talking about, of course, but, you know, just um, thinking about praying over the prologue to the Gospel of John, it's like, not by the will of man, not by your dad's will, your mom's will, Father Gregory's will, but by the will of God. Like, God has chosen you, and when you, when you allow him, when you realize that he's chosen you i mean this is the greatest relief and joy in your life so i, I think you're getting at exactly the key point and, and and so often like my course on grace it really making thomas concrete there so often comes down to either recalling that moment in one's life where you let go of that effort of like i have to figure everything out for myself or i have to define myself and i can cast myself into somebody else's hands, somebody who's trustworthy. Here we move from mom and dad, because we all know over time, my kids are getting older. They've definitely figured out the hip hop. You know, the parents basically are definitely not God. Um, when you give yourself over into the one who is unfailingly faithful to you. And that's sort of the, the, the foundation, the basis for your identity. So um, I, I forgot where you started in your, your question, but... Um, yeah, I, I, the identity question is foundational, but I think also, especially for, for a Catholic where nature has its own integrity and grace enters into it, transforms it, builds on it, um, I think to, to preach and witness that in a really rich way, 
allows someone to still be themselves and become fully a child of God. So I, I might have lost the thread of your question in some no, way. No, no, that's good. Yeah. Uh, but, I, think, but I, th I think it is yeah, very experiential, yeah. And 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 when I, I'll say just one more thing here. You know, the seminaries here that they're wonderful. They really have a heart of service, and um, and they see like in their in their PFEs and this and that that there's a lot of brokenness, a lot of darkness, and and in some ways it feels like there's there are forces cultivating this, deepening it, um, in really harmful ways. And there's a lot of need for. For, for guidance, for direction, but especially for this strong affirmation. You are a beloved. There's other issues to deal with. You're a beloved child of God, and that is never, ever going to fail. And you can't hear that. You can't receive that except in the context of the church. Okay, so I want to draw an analogy to freedom as described by G.K. Chesterton so that we can inquire into our freedom within the setting of the church. Okay, so um, pr prior to pushing record, we were talking about this dialectic in the modern age between uh, authority and liberty or the perceived dialectic or dichotomy even. Um, but, but I think that, you know, we're, we're kind of proposing within our Catholic setting a synthesis that freedom comes through a kind of submission to authority. A lot of people don't like that word submission, but there it is. The word has been said. Yeah. Um, so yeah. an example that Chesterton gives in one of his, I've forgotten which essays, is he describes uh, the lawless world in its, you know, putative freedom becomes a kind of chaos. He says, picture a group of children who are told to explore an island. All right, maybe they're playing a game, maybe they're doing whatever. Doesn't matter too terribly much. But let's say that the island is circled about by very sheer cliffs. So if there's no management of the situation, he says the children are likely to find themselves huddled together at the center of the island for fear that they might fall headlong over the cliffs. But if you build a small parapet even around the edge of the island, just so as to, to hem them in and give them a sense of the bounds or the kind of frontiers of their freedom, then they can explore it and enjoy it to its limit. So I think that what we're experiencing right now in the 21st century in a variety of settings is this kind of promise of limitless freedom. But what you're seeing is more anguish and anxiety than ever before. Uh, and I think that this also extends to our understanding of and engagement with the church. I, I often talk to people who are you know, just outside of the church and they're thinking about whether or not to enter the church, but they're comparing different ecclesial communions and they're kind of you know, like making an Excel macro so as to navigate this traveling salesman problem with greatest efficacy and it's like bruv it's just <laughs> <laughs> no yeah it's like there's no freedom to be found yep. in that so how does one how does one find freedom in you know membership incorporation or in this kind of difficult question of a ecclesial affiliation oh boy well i think yeah the text i was alluding to you i, I should grab it don't be alarmed but um well i can also show you uh a very dear colleague of mine in the seminary gave me, I have two copies, a signed copy by Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. Um, yeah, but at the end, when he's talking about the dialogue, or the dialectic rather, between um, authority and experience as um, sort of the modern crisis. I mean, honestly, I think, you know what, I'm going to set this aside. Um, a, a text we used to use in our core class, but it's out of print. For some reason, Ignatius stopped publishing it. Um, Christian, the crisis of cultures. Um, the way that um, Pope Benedict XVI enters into this is by is an anthropological perspective. So, in, like Votia, but or John Paul II, um, but a little bit different. And he makes the argument for about fifty pages that yes, we're free. We're different from rocks, obviously, but um, certainly rabbits and other things like that. But he makes the argument that we're also beings. He's really drawing a lot on Gadamer and Keeper here. Like we're beings of, um, we're, we're not Cartesian minds that are dropped into, or brains that are dropped into that. So that is, we have presuppositions, we have a language, we come from a certain community, but we're also beings of trust. You know, we, we could not get out of bed in the morning and open our door and walk into the, the Swiss countryside if we didn't take for granted that you know how, how gravity works and how the traffic is functioning and 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 assume that there's oxygen for us to breathe and so on. like like we're not figuring stuff out at that level at that sort of everyday scientific level 
but even in terms of the complexity of human interactions, I think um, uh, Moral, um, Jean Moral is a really um, great um, writer here on, on um, oh, he has a great book here. It's in the meaning of man. I'm sorry, Mouhou, uh, apologies for that. We said he sort of reflects in a optimistic way about the complexity of human interaction. We have to take a lot for granted. We trust our parents. We trust people around us. As St. Augustine says in the City of God, yes, your friends will probably stab you in the back sooner or later. But on the whole, we simply could not function in society if we didn't take certain things for granted, even just at the level of scientific laws and language. And then what Ratzinger does, he says, he makes the argument that at the natural level, we are beings of trust in a way that doesn't violate our rationality. We have to take things for granted. We come into every context and situation with some formative baggage. And what he's doing there is opening up. It's not, it's not a demonstrative argument, but it's a kind of probable or fittingness argument that when supernatural faith is proposed to us, this is not a violation of our basic freedom. So I, I guess maybe that's a little bit abstract, but as, as to like ecclesial membership, I think the, I think to me part of the challenge is combining like the deep need that people have to hear and realize and live out the fact that they are beloved children of God and that grace and theological truth doesn't close down their epistemic and experiential options, but rather opens them up. The great challenge we have is making that proposal or that argument in a specifically ecclesial form, right? Because on the one hand, we want to we want the church to, in a very particular parish or campus ministry context, to meet people where they are and address their need. But on the other hand, it is not precisely about that particular experience. Like the church kind of stinks a lot, a lot of the time, right? But, but but as as with family though and the family of religious it, it's like there's something liberating about the fact that like yeah I can t I can take things for granted if I'm not in the state of, like I, I just went to mass and I I received everything God has to give me and I bring very little to the table I assure you I, and that that's that's the beauty of family life if you have a teenager who will hardly speak to you there's still dinner and love and you know you know what i mean so so, so to me that's the challenge it is not so much kind of the philosophical sociological argument that um we are beings of trust and that 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 the virtue of faith given to us as a gift is 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 a raising up of this natural faculty and a perfecting of it i think the harder argument is definitely the ecclesial social argument that this is realized in community that you're not alone yeah. Uh, okay. Pursuant to one of those last comments, um, I'm thinking about how we criticize the church, right? So in, in an ordinary setting, criticism is both an expression of frustration and an expression of affection, um, especially if you're willing to tell a person what you think or how that person can potentially heal and grow. Like there's this tradition of Fraternal correction, you know, where if you think something matters, if you think the person that can change, and if you're able to communicate with some modicum of love, it's it's worth, you know, a small confrontation. Now, phenomenologically, like you mentioned, we all have this experience of hearing criticism and sometimes being shocked by it. So it's different when, say, your brother talks to you about your mother and says, yo, this is crazy. Whereas when somebody that you don't know that well says to you about your mother, yo, this is, it's like, hey, you cannot talk about my mother that way. Um, so you're at Mount St. Mary's. I went to uh, Franciscan University of Steubenville, and it's something similar with, you know, devout Catholic schools, whether or not you would accept that title for your own or whether I would accept that for my own. Uh, we'll leave that to the side. Uh, but I, I do. Um, so, um, so like when, when you hear people talk about like, oh, you know, Steubenville's this way and Christendom's that way or Dallas is that way or Mount St. Mary's is that way, it can cause a similar reaction. It's like, what are you doing talking about my school? You didn't go there. You didn't know the first thing. But when I'm with other graduates, I can be like, hey, this thing was crazy, wasn't it? Am I right? Okay, so when it comes to criticizing the church, where do we start and where do we stop? Or how do we express it in the terms that are adjusted to the situation, suffused with love, and ultimately help us to embrace the mystery therein. Thoughts? This is like a minefield to me. You know, I teach <laughs> at a seminary. <laughs> you be fired. 
No, it's, I mean, you referred to fraternal correction. At the end of this course on grace, it, it actually ends with the theological virtues. And I end with those questions to make charity very specific. And, you know, St. Thomas handles it. We have an obligation to correct each other. And then each article, he like narrows it, narrows it, narrows it, like all these conditions, like, you know, you, there can't be hypocrisy. You can't be guilty of the same sin. It has to be private, not public. So it's, to me, it's like classic Sly Thomas. He's like, this is an obligation, but then it's a very, it's a very, I think it's a very narrow and limited context in which one can overtly criticize. And actually that, that public private thing is really, really important because it makes a big difference. And I imagine living in a seminary and religious life, this is extremely important um, to keep things private because if I correct someone or if I say something and, you know, from social media, this and that, that, that capacity to take responsibility for your words is absolutely essential. So I think every site that claimed, every site, every author, every form of social media that claims to be with or speak in any sense for the church should absolutely require accountability. Nothing anonymous at all. Okay. But, th but that's a bit of an aside. Um, but like, I, I mean, criticizing the church, oh, that's a huge thing. I'm a very critical person. So that's why I get really anxious about your question. But, but yeah. When I did the seminar at U of T um, with, about um, my conversion story with Father Andrew Summerson, uh, it was published in this this book that no one will read from Ignatius Press called like by strange ways. You know what I said in there was like I was I was like very committed. And I think pretty well from Anglican, ended up in the United States in a very evangelical context where people hop churches quite a bit, and and then moving here. For me, and I'm not trying to say, oh, I'm an example of submission. I'm definitely not. But, you know, I, 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 did, I, I did RCA because I realized that families divided don't do a good job raising their children in the faith. Whole other, other story. It was, it was terrible. Um, and parish, it was terrible. No pastor for seven or eight years. At a point that I realized that this is Jesus and the sacrament, so this is the church. So the rest kind of doesn't really matter. I mean, it's things that do matter, but in a sense, they don't matter. I had to realize that all the stuff I didn't like with the liturgy, the music, the preaching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera like it just doesn't matter. Okay, it does matter, but it just, it, it's, and I think sometimes like with our students who are really passionate, like the, the Latin mass or the, the music, in my college, we sang Palestrina every Thursday night Everyone stand there for eight minutes while we say the Curia and the Gloria. Take that. I don't understand Catholics and liturgical music. Okay. It just doesn't matter because Jesus is there in the sacrament. Okay. Where it does matter is about formation and reverence. And when you get into family life and children, you see the ways that bad practices hurt them. Um, so, but, but at a more practical level, like criticism, I think. But my point to to just to bring that to a close, sorry to ramble a bit, but is especially for young people who are beautifully committed to the faith, they're such a witness to me, um, and want to serve the church in every in every aspect of their life. Even they, like I, need to be reminded of what's primary and what's secondary, what's tertiary, and how those things are related. Um, and what's primary is that the Holy Spirit is given to the church. This is not, the priest doesn't make the magic happen. It's God through the priest. You know what I mean? It, it, the say it is the church, but the church is, is the way to the one and only savior. And this is unbelievable. We are incredibly unworthy of it. So then how to get to, well, why does the priest wear that stupid, that stupid garment? And why does he not follow the rubrics or this or that? Actually back to Thomas's, I think it's not strictly speaking fraternal correction, but I think um, I, I think having a, again, distinguishing the secondary, the tertiary and, um, being grateful. Um, but also honestly, I, I probably shouldn't say that, uh, but speaking of the virtue of patience and perseverance and the way that the law of love extends to our neighbors that, um, yeah, trying to embody the beatitude of this, the virtue of being this in our life too. So honestly, it's it's better to shut up first than to speak. I'm I'm talking about myself. I'm not talking to anybody else. You know, 
and and I, I have very sarcastic humor and sometimes that goes very bad no, it, it can be very bad I think I'm being very funny and sometimes I hurt somebody um and I don't mean to um sometimes I'm I'm sitting in in daily mass and I'm thinking oh, no no and just and just no, this is not about me and my judgment in a certain sense and uh, yeah I, I would say meekness and docility I, I can be more specific but I, I no, just no, no, that's, it about yeah. me yeah no, that's um, great I, I yeah I, th I think that people experience a certain nervousness uh when it comes to yeah maybe maybe not this particular question but applications of this question in the you know like the 20th and 21st century and I think it's good to talk about it in a principled way uh because it because it is hard to navigate because you know you bring up quite a few excellent points like the difference between public and private is significant uh, also like whether or not it concerns scandal you know could people be misled and if so how gravely for whom are you responsible what are the appropriate means whereby to proffer this correction is there accountability and transparent like those are all super excellent and pertinent considerations but it's it is really really hard to navigate uh, because i think that you know, if you if you find yourself in a situation where no one in your immediate vicinity is willing to acknowledge, you know, the blemishes uh, of the church in her present instantiation, you can feel a bit gaslit, you know, like, does no one else see that? You know, you feel like you might be going crazy. Um, so it's good to have a kind of, you know, accompaniment in the, you know, the way in which the church is still on the way, okay, just to leave it kind of at that. Uh, but to do so in a way that remains faithful, or to do so in a way that remains, like you said, meek, um, and docile, a way that remains open to the revelation and salvation which our Lord mediates through the church, because it's his bride, you know, because it's a because of the holiness of the bridegroom that the church remains, you know, pure and spotless without any stain or wrinkle. So, yeah, I, I think that sometimes we kind of clam up, depending on the setting, we clam up because we don't want to fall in with those who, who criticize very freely or very liberally. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, like we don't want to say like, ah, you know, like I can say certain things in my living room, but I can't say them on the Internet. And I don't know why, because, you know, mm -hmm. dot, dot, dot. So yeah. I don't know if you have further thoughts on on the basis of that. I don't know. I, I mean, uh, when George Wyatt gave this talk last week, he said, you know, Twitter is by its very nature a platform for demagoguery. Um, but on the other hand, you know, look, I mean, <laughs> a professor here, Dr. Luis Vera is doing some work with the relevant. Um, uh, it's not a congregation, but. Oh, you know, the, the Vatican is trying to make moves in its own slow, beautiful, slow way um, into um, social media and stuff like that and just using the tools of technology in appropriate ways. So I, I don't want to completely dismiss these things, despite the fact that I agree. I think they're 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 very limited use. But, but I think you're suggesting this, that that um, I think a certain clarity of teaching is absolutely necessary and the medium for teaching has to has to fit um preaching on sunday for eight minutes is not adequate to this but um but i think of most of the things most of the points where i hear a lot of criticism of the church um if it's not personal or if it's not a priest um just outright teaching falsehood or something like that yeah tend to be about big surprise things like liturgy music and and this and that and it, it's more in those cases where i think a certain Try to take the long view, take a basically docile approach, differentiate the primary and the secondary is really important. Am I missing kind of what you're what you have in mind? Can you be more explicit there? No, no, that's that, that that's that's fine. Yeah. I, I guess maybe as a final point or a final question, uh, before we wrap up, I think it might help too just to clarify how ecclesial relationships are different than political relationships. Because I think a lot of people feel a certain anxiety to express their criticism, to express their opinion, so that way they're kind of their vote is accounted for, their voice is heard, and so that whatever engines of power might grind along in such a way as to realize the desired end. Um, and so we, we kind of form ourselves into camp and we either retrench here or we double down here. We do things which we wouldn't ordinarily do except that we thought that it's either all or nothing. So maybe, yeah, just as a kind of final point, could you say a word about how ecclesial relationships are different than political relationships? Well, um, the glue or the lifeblood of the church is well charity which which is the blood of christ poured out um it's not opinion it's not majority versus minority and i, I don't even want to say you know it has to that the church is monarchical which it is but being canadian i'm comfortable with monarchy the way the <laughs> mayor not just making just provoking you there so but, but fundamentally Truly like provoked. like like chair um 
I mean, charity and what this asks of us, I'm thinking of the Beatitudes, um, you know, to be a peacemaker, but, but especially the characteristic of mercy and forgiveness. Uh, you think of those, um, I mentioned in, in the talk I, I gave at, at the University of Toronto, uh, um, like Pope John Paul II, 1983, going to forgive the man who shot him in jail. But, but even the things that happen in the theater of war in different contexts, like in World War II, when people do things that we don't expect them to do, the light of the gospel shines forth all the more clearly. So, so I, I'm, I'm sort of evading your question while, while responding to it. I think ecclesial relations are different from political ones because it's a family and it's a father. We are adopted children of God. But we're all not slaves. We're sons and daughters. We're heirs. So we have rights, people. Um, but we're still children. And um, so those relations should be marked by piety and reverence. But they also sh also should be marked by affection and warmth and respect. And and I don't I don't expect I don't need respect or warmth from my congressman. Um, but I just want to do his job and be honest and stuff like that. Um, so, so I guess that's kind of the first thing I say is that we're a family. We're actually a body. Um, yes. And, and that, that should, that should be evident at the, at the particular level, the local level. And I guess this, the, the second thing on my mind was, um, um, it is in light of the marks of a church, one holy Catholic apostolic. If the mark of apostolicity is really foundational historically in a sense and ecclesiologically, um, the mark of unity is the first, and it's the first wound of the church. We see evidence of this wound apparent in the Acts of the Apostles. It's right away a problem. Um, I just just to um, refer to wonderful homily that I heard. I think it was a week ago Sunday. No, it, I I don't remember the, what the gospel reading is. I'm sorry, but um, you know, to strive in brotherly love, sort of Pauline language. You know, um, the priest proposed or he challenged, like, what would it actually look like if we lived like what Jesus was asking of us in the Beatitudes? Like, if we actually thought of our neighbor, the neighbor beside me who does 18 annoying things, or the person in front of me with whom I disagree about the liturgy or this or that, if before I spoke, I just checked myself and by the grace of the Holy Spirit thought better of this person than myself. Like, what would we look like as the body of Christ? So to me, that's the second element, as it were, of um, the difference between political and ecclesial relations. First of all, it's a family animated by charity. Second of all, as a particular example or instantiation of that, um, that that privileging of the good of the other. It, it's a goodwill, as you say, like the, that harmony glens with which we approach everything. Do we really think, assume the best of other people, or are we kind of looking for faults all the time? But to really privilege to see, like, this is this is Christ before me, this other person. If that's in the Constitution, I missed it. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, excellent. No, that's, that's super helpful. And I think, too, maybe just by way of final thought from me, um, I, I meditate often on the mystery of predilection, uh, often by way of the litany of humility, the last invocation of which is that others be loved more than I, or excuse me, that others become holier than I, provided that I become as holy as I should. I think that St. Therese really had an insight into, you know, the way forward is to kind of play your part and to be small because you fit better within the body when you seek to be small. You cause a lot of friction, you cause a lot of problems when you seek to be big uh, or you pursue your own self-aggrandizement. And I think that there is a kind of, um, yeah, ecclesial virtue as it were, to recognize how God is loving you and to seek to respond to those gifts and graces, particularly without lamenting past graces not seized upon or lusting after future graces never to be accorded, but to like live in the church in the present, which bears grace, um, and then to be able to recognize it in those with whom you live or with, with whom you have this life of charity. So I, I, <laughs> I, I got, I got the, the hint that you're ending up bringing things to a close, but because I'm doing an undergraduate course in the sacraments of theology majors, uh, I do, I found it very interesting and I think needs to be emphasized more that the ecclesial dimension of the sacraments is something that is often um, just missed, either in catechesis or just in life. So we're, we're just starting to the sacrament of penance 
and like the way that my my sins my failures yes they offend god they disfigure me but they hurt you too um i i think that, that a, a kind of a catechesis and appreciation of that um my students had found that really bizarre but provocative and i think it's very important as well so yeah and the grace of absolution reconciles me not only to god but to you as well so absolutely a grace from which we both profit yes thanks be to god okay yeah well thanks so much for taking the time um i appreciate it um for our listeners maybe a word about how folks can find more of your work or things that you have written or spoken on that you might want to highlight here at the end oh my goodness i mean <laughs> that, that that yeah i wasn't expecting that question but um you can I'm say Google just, my name. I'm just being department chair. I'm starting a big project with a bunch of other people about touching on uh, sex and gender. Father Michael Sherwin knows about that. So I'm just going to, that's not my area at all. I avoid moral theology as much as possible. <laughs> but um, I, I, I have a couple of things that just came out and um, I really can't remember where they are um, on, on sacrifice. Oh, nice. That okay. came out in a book. It was at a conference, um, um, City of God, book 10. And okay. um, before that, in a book on um, on creation, about oh my goodness, George Grant, Saint Augustine on beauty, systemic beauty in particular, beauty. I think I'm actually confusing two things. So, um, <laughs> what, what is on? I can get the books out; they're over there, but I don't want to step out of the frame. So you're uh, right. You're right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. it's good. Um, so certainly, those who want to follow up with things on Saint Augustine. Um, city of God so in particular, please. And good luck with that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. An excellent recommendation. Um, wonderful. Okay. So then turning to you, the listener, thanks so much for having tuned into this episode of the Tomisic Institute podcast, Off Campus Conversations. Maybe we should come up with a longer name for a future iteration. That way it'll take longer to say. Um, if you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the Tomisic Institute podcast, whether on your podcast app or on YouTube. And uh, yeah, that's it. So know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us and we'll look forward to chatting with you at the next opportunity.